Hi folks, Astronomy Live here. I want to do a video addressing some recent issues with truthfulness in reporting from various sources. For example, this article in the Daily Star earlier in July, claiming that a particular astronomer believed in Nibiru and claimed that Nibiru was responsible for the current state of the planet Mars, among other things. And so you can see the headline here, Into the World Shock. That's always a red flag right there. This is going to be a disastrously dishonest article. Rogue Planet Nibiru Destroyed Life on Mars and Earth is Next. And it goes on to make very specific claims about a real Serbian astronomer, and I apologize if I butchered the names, Milorad Protic. And it claims that he believed Nibiru was real. Uh, it goes on to say that he believed it was in a 3,600-year orbit and that it devastated the planet Mars. And it was last in our inner solar system in about 1580 BC, which, if you do the math, that means it should be arriving again within the next couple of years. Now, the information about this astronomer seems to be coming from this website right here. And it goes on to make some specific claims, not only about this astronomer, but about his daughter, claiming that she fought in the courts to hide his beliefs and to hide his re revolutionary, groundbreaking research on Nibiru. And so I want to address this. I reached out to his daughter. He was a real astronomer. Uh, he made numerous discoveries of asteroids and comets. And his daughter is also an astronomer and is continuing his legacy. Uh, and so it claims in this article that she filed injunctions with the Supreme Court of her country uh, to try to keep his Nibiru research hidden. So I sent an email to her and this morning I received a reply that I want to read to you. So, I've blanked out her email address and my name for privacy purposes, but uh, this is what it says. Thank you very much for kindly informing me of that article that appeared in the daily newspaper Daily Star regarding some alleged diary entries of my deceased father, Milorad Protic who was a professional astronomer and devoted his entire life and work to astronomy and the Belgrade Astronomical Observatory, Serbia, former Yugoslavia. The source of information mentioned in Daily Star, even when I am personally concerned, is tenditious, malicious, and combines some true facts about Protic and his alleged involvement and even predictions of planet Nibiru, Planet X, apparently with an intention to discredit his scientific work and contribution to astronomical science in the broadest sense. Of all that is stated in the mentioned article, it is only true that Milorad, uh, born 1911, died 2001, was the leading astronomer of the Belgrade Astronomical Observatory, its director, a member of the IAU International Astronomical Union Commission 20, minor planets, comets, and meteors, as well as a member of other scientific and professional organizations in the country and abroad. I particularly point out the fact that he has always been a fierce opponent of quasi-scientific interpretations of cosmic phenomena and has never allowed any arbitrary approach in astronomical, theoretical, and practical interpretations beyond the strict verification through observational data. He has been involved in the Moon's motion theory research and has discovered 33 minor planets, of which 10 were named. By the way, he actually has an asteroid named after him, and she has an asteroid named after her, the person who wrote this email, his daughter. Just wanted to throw that in there. I thank you very much once again for your effort to inform me of all this matter, and I, as a professional astronomer and researcher of the Belgrade Astronomical Observatory, will find ways to protect name and work of my father, Milorad, uh, Protich, and consequently the reputation of my honorable family. Best regards. I think that says it all. Um, it's one thing when tabloids like this make ridiculous claims about the end of the world coming next week and so forth. 
But I think they're starting to cross a line here. This is, in my opinion, defamation of a real astronomer and trying to pin the Biru nonsense on him because they can't find a reputable astronomer to pin it on. Now, let me use that to segue into this article by Dr. Claudia Albers, claiming that the lunar eclipse less than a week ago was fake. So, in this article, she claims, for one thing, that the images of the lunar eclipse were impossible and wrong, and that the quality of the images was equivalent to that taken with cell phones, and that even observatories could not get better images with their telescopes, claiming that this is due to it being some sort of, I don't know, projection, some sort of fake moon in the sky. Well, it takes no more than a two-second search on sites like Flickr, where high-quality images from telescopes around the world can be found, to see that indeed the moon looked just fine, like it does in any given total lunar eclipse. Uh, here is an image. You can see um, very beautiful colors here, uh, and about two minutes before the end of totality, so you're getting a little bit of blue color there refracting uh, through the Earth's atmosphere and bouncing off the moon, and then the deep red on the opposite side of the moon. Uh, you can see that in previous images of the moon, of course, during total eclipses. Here's an image taken in late totality uh, by myself eight years ago. And uh, yeah, no real difference in quality. If anything, the, the newest image looks a little better. Who would have thought it as camera technology advances, the images of the moon coming from various amateurs gets better and better. Okay, so let's proceed. She goes on to calculate the length of the eclipse and claims that it couldn't have been as long as it actually was, that it was impossibly long at 103 minutes, when it could not have been longer than 95.8 minutes. And she goes on to break down the calculations here. Now keep in mind, this is someone who introduces herself as a professional physicist with a PhD. And so she can't claim ignorance of physics, of the equations she's using, and yet she's using her credentials as a way of trying to give herself credibility here. I don't talk about this very often on my channel at all. I do have a PhD. It doesn't really matter. It's not in astronomy. I am a professional scientist, but I am not a professional astronomer. I am an amateur astronomer, and I do this because I love it. Um, and I hate to see it abused, quite honestly. But when somebody's using their credentials to try to give themselves credibility, that doesn't absolve them of accuracy in their reporting and in their calculations. Okay? So, if we look at her calculations, what do we find? She shows a diagram of um, the orientation of the moon relative to the Earth, relative to the sun during a total lunar eclipse, and calculates the size of the Earth's umbral shadow at the distance of the moon during the eclipse, and also the moon's speed at perigee and apogee, to, in order to calculate how long it would take the moon to transit the Earth's shadow. Now, here's the part where she calculates the moon's velocity, right in here, in the middle of this page. This is a very familiar equation to anyone who is even an undergrad level physics student. And it's very familiar to me as well. There's just one problem. It's the wrong equation. It's the equation for the velocity of a circular orbit. Okay? V equals the square root of the con gravitational constant times the mass of the object divided by the distance or radius of that circular orbit. If we go back to her paper, that's the same equation we see her using here even though she's trying to calculate the velocity of the moon at perigee, which by definition means it's not a circular orbit. It's calculating the orbital velocity of the moon when it's at its closest to Earth. It's the wrong equation. This is the right equation. This is the equation you have to use when calculating velocity at any given point in an elliptical orbit and you have to account for the semi-major axis of the orbit. In other words, it's an elliptical orbit. It's not always at that distance. 
that's the closest it's distance it gets uh, to the Earth at perigee. And if you want to calculate the velocity at apogee, conversely, the furthest it gets from Earth. So you have to use this equation. She's using the wrong equation to start with. Okay, so her calculations are a little off right off the bat. In fact, uh, the moon's perigee velocity there, given her numbers, should be about 1.022 kilometers per second, given a semi-major axis of about 384,400 kilometers. Okay, um, at apogee, according to the correct equation, it should be about uh, 0.961 kilometers per second. If you do it her way, it's faster at 0.99 kilometers per second. Convenient if you're trying to claim that it's transiting through the shadow too quickly. Just pointing that out here. Again, she claims to be a professional physicist, so um, she can't claim to be ignorant of this equation. Every physics undergrad should learn this at some point. Either that or it's just massive incompetence. Take your pick. But it's wrong the way she's doing it. Now, that's one problem, but that's not the only problem. There's a bigger issue here that her calculations completely overlook. It's not a stationary situation. During the eclipse, the Earth and Moon are continuing to orbit the Sun. She's not accounting for this at all. And it may not seem like much, but over the first hour and a half, uh, where she claims that the eclipse should be over in about 95 minutes, the Earth and Moon have already orbited the Sun a little bit. How much? Well, do the math. Uh, if you do the math, and uh, again, let's actually calculate it the right way. Let's actually calculate the true uh, apogee velocity of the Moon at 0.961 kilometers per second. And also, let's calculate the diameter of the Earth's umbral shadow at apogee, which uh, for the date and time that this eclipse occurred, it should have been about 8,991 kilometers by my calculations. Uh, it should transit that distance in about 95.7 minutes. It's a very simple calculation. But in that 95.7 minutes, uh, you've completed... Uh, if, you, if you look at the Earth's orbit as a circle, just let's approximate it as a circular orbit around the Sun, Let's just do very quick and dirty calculations here. And I will preface this again by saying these are very quick and dirty calculations. These are not intended to be super precise here. Let's just see if it's plausible that the eclipse was this long, okay? That's something she, you won't see her doing. You, you'll see her treating her calculations as if they're the absolute truth and something must be physically wrong with the universe if her calculations are wrong. Um, but you're doing a very simple quick and dirty calculation here. Uh, if we treat the Earth's orbit as circular around the Sun and we look at the period of time that the eclipse took place, the Earth should have moved around in that circle by about 0.065 degrees. And then we can calculate what that translates to in terms of a distance at the Moon. So in other words, the Earth's shadow is pointing in a slightly different location as it moves around in its orbit around the Sun, and it's now moved a little bit. Uh, Earth and the Moon are going around the Sun clockwise in this diagram, and so is the Moon. The Moon's orbiting the Earth clockwise, so the shadow is essentially tracking with the Moon. Not as quick as the Moon, of course, but it's not insignificant. You have to account for it. Uh, so, again, uh, the shadow's moved in its position by about 0 0.065 degrees. Now, at the lunar apogee distance of about 406,000 kilometers at the time of the eclipse, this corresponds to an additional distance that the moon has to cover to get out of the shadow of about 465 kilometers. You just take the angular size, or the angular distance, that the Earth has moved in its orbit of 0 0.065 degrees, and simply calculate what the angular size is at the Moon's distance. And it comes out to about 465 kilometers. Now you divide that by 0 0.961 kilometers per second, the velocity of the Moon at apogee, and that comes out as about 480, uh, about 484 seconds, or about 8 minutes. 
Now take 8 minutes and add the original time of 95.7 minutes. What do you get? You get 103.7 minutes. What do you know? It's exactly right, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, because the actual eclipse lasted 103 minutes, and we find out when we account for the orbital velocity of the Earth, and of course the Moon is traveling with the Earth around the Sun, uh, we come out with a total time of totality of about 103 minutes. So it seems right on, right on track there. So again, these things are not unusual. There is no Nibiru about to arrive and devastate our planet two years from now. Uh, and I'm sorry to say, but the total lunar eclipse on July 27th was completely normal, as was the duration of time it took to do it. So I hope that clears up these matters. Thanks for watching. Clear skies, folks.